Yeah. Let's do it. Let's get in the word of the Lord here. Hey, let's, uh, man, I, I really believe the Lord, uh, the Lord's got a good word for us this morning. Um, but man, let's, let's just, let's just dive into prayer real quick and then we'll get into it. Lord Jesus, I just pray God that man, that you, uh, man, your spirit intercedes today. I just pray that this message, man, this message does not fall on deaf ears. This is an urgent message. And I just pray that man, your spirit allows me to speak this well, allow me to be a mouthpiece for you and that your word that I speak today. Uh, man, pierces their mind and their heart. That, that's my prayer, that they throw out any distractions, that this is not just a film room, this is a, a place of worship right now. That's my prayer, God, and I pray this in your name. Amen? Amen, amen. amen. Like I said, we got a good word, but for, first I want to start off with a little story. We, um, anybody uh, ever, you guys know I went to Dallas Theological Seminary. Dallas Theological Seminary is a place where you go and you, you learn the Bible. That's where I met my beautiful bride. It's a grad school. Um, but I also met a guy there by the name of Josiah. That's why I named my kid Josiah. And I knew I was going to like the guy uh, when we were doing introductions in class one day. I, and he stands up and he says, my name is Josiah Boyd. I'm from Canada. I don't like the cold. I don't like hockey. And I don't like Celine Dion. Celine Dion's from Canada. I just thought that was funny. But we had a lot of the common. Uh, we worked out together. We were built a lot of light. Of course, he was about five foot uh, seven. Uh, he, I knew he was a wrestler. I heard he had a little bit of wrestling experience, and he did some MMA stuff on the side. Uh, he would sneak away on the weekends. But one day, we're all hanging out. About seven or eight of us were in the rec room, and uh, we got a nice little rec room in our apartment. Uh, and what happens when you get about six or seven dudes, a lot of testosterone in the room, like you start roughhousing a little bit, what do you do? Wrestle. Yeah, you wrestle. You wrestle and you fight. But for some reason, everybody wanted me to match up with Josiah. Like I said, Probably because we were built a lot alike. And I'm like, whatever, man. This is my opportunity to show everybody in seminary I'm, I'm a tough guy, right? And so uh, I was like, yeah, bring it on, man. Let's go. And so anybody in here ever wrestled? Like, you guys actually, like, really wrestled? Okay. All right. So my dad wrestled growing up. And he said that, man, what you do, if they, ha if they get down and have both their arms on the ground, man, you try to do something called breaking the table leg. Like, you take your arm, you try to break their arm, make it collapse, and you can roll them over, you can pin them, or you can or he could try to choke him out. And that was going through my mind the whole time. I'm thinking, man, I'm about to break this dude's arm. I like the guy, but man, I'm, again, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to show everybody that I am somebody. You're trying to break his arm. I was trying to break his arm. I was trying to hurt him. And so I went down I'm, and I, I positioned myself on top of him and I go to hit his arm. And man, I swing as hard as I could to try to break his arm, collapse his arm. He knew it was coming and he collapsed his arm. And next thing you know, he rolls underneath me and up my back, and within 16 seconds, bro, the dude just choked me out. I'm tapping. I'm tapping quick. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. All right. What I found out was this dude had a little bit more than just a little bit of wrestling experience. I mean, I had about 16 days of wrestling experience in middle school, but this dude was Canada's national champion. He was their Olympian. Dude, I hung out with the guy for five months. He never said a word. He's the most humble guy I've ever met. But this is him right here. This is Josiah Boyd. I shot him an email. I shot him an email. I said, hey, bro, I said, uh, I said, I need a picture of you wrestling. No homo, not trying to be weird or anything like that. And he said, man, no worries at all. I get at least three requests a week of pictures of me in spandex. So this is, this is him right here. My guy, J just so boy, what's up? That's, yeah, of course. Of course. No homo here. I got I to ask him a question. I'm asking a picture of him in spandex, right? All right. But what I want to talk to you guys today uh, this morning uh, is a passage in scripture that talks about another type of reversal. Like this was a, he, he put a good reversal move on me. It was a reversal of fortune. Things didn't end up the way that I thought they were going to end up. But we're going to talk about another reversal of fortune. And this is the reversal of life. How things may not end up at the end of life the way that you thought that they were going to end up or the way someone may think they're going to end up. And this is a sermon about hell. Now, how many times have you ever heard a sermon about hell in your church? One, one two, okay. You don't hear it very often. A lot of times, man, everybody wants to tell you the, the feel-good sermon or, or whatever. And all that's okay. All that's okay. But I think it's important. Timothy even warns us of this. He says, for a time is coming when people will no longer listen to the sound and wholesome teaching but they will follow their own desires, their selfish desires, and they will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want you to hear. 
That's what he says. And I think you guys know me by now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot you straight, right? Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you. And Lord willing, uh, Lord willing, uh, that this passage will help you reflect, uh, man, on your life. And so we're going to dive right into it. This is Luke 16. Uh, we're starting in verse 19, and this goes to verse 31. Now, just to set the stage, you got the Pharisees. We, we we always talk about the religious leaders, the Pharisees of that day, and Jesus's day. They considered themselves, though, their wealth to be a proof of a person's righteousness and faithfulness. So, if you had those things, they just thought you were just extremely blessed. But which is no really no different than today, right? We see someone's nice house. We see someone's nice outfit, someone's shoes, someone's pit position, someone's job, and we immediately say, oh, man, that person must be blessed. They must be blessed, which they may be, right? But we're going to talk about in Scripture what it truly means uh, to be blessed. So let's find out what that's like. Here we go. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, and he lived in luxury every day. So we read that he's living the good life, this rich man. Life is one continual party it says he's wearing purple linen which we know is an expensive dye apparently is extracted from some type of snail so it's hard to get but he's living the good life here and we read that at his gate at his gate laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table even the dogs came and they licked this man's sore. So he's getting licked by dogs. Dogs back in the day, they fed off of garbage, um, dead bodies, human bodies and animals. They didn't have pedigree or kibbles and bits, right? But we read, man, this do these dogs are licking this man's sores, and I can't imagine the infections and the smells that, were, that, that Lazarus had, right? Um, the bacteria being imported or transported into the crevices of his souls. I mean, that's disgusting. Would you agree? It's pretty gross. And so it reads, the time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. We all know who Abraham is. Father Abraham. Uh, all religions, or all the main religions in the world believe in Abraham. So here's the, the, the poor man. He's by Abraham's side. But the rich man also died. And it reads, he was buried in Hades, where he was in torment. Okay, now I want you to notice that this verse indicates the dead will know their fate immediately. Like when you die, you'll know immediately, immediately where you are. Okay, now I'm going to use the word Hades and hell. And Hades is simply just a synonym of hell. Just moving forward so you know that those words may intertwine. But Hades and hell is also different than what we, talk, what we call the lake of fire, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute that you also hear about in Revelation 19 and 20. But we know he's in torment. And so he looks up, and he saw Abraham uh, uh, far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called him. He said, look, Father Abraham, have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this fire. So here you see this great reversal, right? This reversal of fortune with the rich man. He's suffering in Hades with the, with the unfaithful. And you got Lazarus, who's at peace at Abraham's side. And so he's like, man, send Lazarus. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and put it in my mouth. The other day at Ian's house, you had some mad dog hot sauce, right? Was there ever a point... While you're eating that mad dog hot sauce that was so hot that you're going to put another man's finger in your mouth. Absolutely not. You would not do that. No question I would. That's right. <laughs> this dude was in agony, right? That's what it says here. And, he, and you, know he's, you know it's bad when he's willing to stick another man's finger in his mouth. But Abraham replied, he said, son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things while Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here and you are in agony. Anybody ever been to a campfire? Bonfire? Anything? You guys are just close to a fire in the house? You know, growing up, we used to go to church camp. I went to church camp. There'd be 400 people around the fire, and I used to, me and my boys used to always try to get to the front so we can sing and dance and be seen, right? But I just remember being about 10 feet away from that fire, and it being so hot, 
and I'm, I'm, I'm taking off my jacket, I'm putting people in front of me because the heat from that fire, I'm 10 feet away. But this man's in the fire. So imagine the agony, and Abraham's like, you show no compassion for others, so no compassion will be shown to you. And he says, besides all this, between you, uh, us and you is a great chasm. It's been put in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot. This is, this is crazy. Nor can anyone cross over there to us. So most scholars believe that this great chasm uh, that surrounds the, the Hades and hell is what we call the lake of fire, making any escape in, uh, uh, impossible, which eventually everyone in hell will be thrown into at the end of the 1,000-year millennium. Now, this is a lot of theology, and I, I do get it that I'm, I'm taking a 40-minute sermon, and I'm condensing it down to 25 minutes, so if you have any questions uh, at the end, you can always text me, and we can talk about this stuff here. But to illustrate it fur further, does anybody know what this is? This is Alcatraz. What's that? This is Alcatraz, right? Um, Alcatraz uh, sits in San Francisco about a mile and a half off the shore. Uh, you can actually sit on the shore of San Francisco and you can look out and you can see uh, Alcatraz. Man, this place struck fear in the hearts of criminals. It held some of the most notorious criminals in the world. Um, it was said that if you were to break out of these walls, you'd have to swim a mile and a half of shark cold infested waters and and I, I tell you uh, people apparently had tried but they presumed to just be to drown they were never found again they disappeared um, but one of the worst things is the inmate imagine you're on this island again let's just pretend this is Hades this is hell and surrounding Hades and hell uh, is the lake of fire right but imagine being an inmate here and looking out of that jail cell window at the joy that you're missing out on, the life that you're missing out on, looking out on that city. That'd be terrible, would it not? Be sitting in jail looking at the city and the joy and the fun that, that you're missing out on. That was the rich man. The rich man looked up, and the worst part about it, man, he could actually see the eternal life and the joy that he was missing out on. So we can legitimately talk about what it'd be like if a person in hell can catch glimpses uh, of heaven and imagine that. Imagine, imagine uh, missing out on heaven because you rejected Christ and his offer of salvation, but also being eternally reminded of that as well. And here you have that environment with not a second relief from the fire, uh, never a, a water or a cool breeze to cool you off and the knowledge that this is going to be forever. And he's like, man, you, you want a drop of water? Sorry, man. There's a chasm in place, man. I can't, I can't get to you. And so we know that in Luke 16, man, it was immediate torment the moment that he opened up his eyes. He doesn't have the option of lying down. He doesn't have the option of going to sleep. And I know how you all love your naps. None of that. It's this ongoing, agonizing, suffering, hopelessness of the situation. Do you, 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 you guys feel where we're at now? Like hell sucks. Hell's a bad place. And we have a hard time imagining that because we have never seen the fullness of God's wrath unleashed on sin, at least here on earth. Here on earth, uh, his, his wrath is tempered by his mercy and his grace. And you hear a lot of pastors talk about that all the time. Oh, mercy and grace. Man, all that's true. I teach my kids mercy and grace. When I, sometimes I don't really want to spank my kids. I'll say, Josiah... Do you want me to show you some mercy and grace? Because I'm, you know, I'm about to whoop his behind. He's like, yes, show me mercy. And I'll show him mercy. I won't spank him. And I'll teach him this is what God did for us. And now he's, every time i got to spank my kid now, he's like, show me mercy. Show me mercy. Show me mercy. But, um, but there, in Hades, in hell, there's no protection from the fierce, unrestrained judgment against sin. And so he realizes, man, the rich man realizes this is not good. This is not good. Now, two words. Two words that you never want to hear from God in the English language. is too late. Too late. God is a God of mercy beyond all human comprehension, but sometimes people say that we serve a God of mercy and His mercy is infinite. 
all that is true, but it's infinite with boundaries. And that boundary is the end of life. Because at the end of life, it's true, it's too late. Once you die as an unsaved person, you may cry for mercy, you may cry for Jesus, you may, you may cry for, for Jesus, but it's too late. There's no probation, there's no purgatory, there's no ankle brace while you wait your trial and hopes for a release. There, there's none of that, right? And this is why, honestly, man, this is why I want to have this talk with you. Because for many of you, I may never see you again. You may hit the portal next year. You may, you may go professional. You may die walking out of here. You may die on the court later on this afternoon. I may never, never see you again. And I want to be able to stand before the Lord someday in confidence and say, listen, I told them about the reality of hell. I told them what's going to happen with an unsaved person. So I can wash, wash my hands and say, Lord, listen, I did everything I could. I, I, I gave them hard truth, and I, I have to let them decide how they want to respond to it. And that's why I wanted to have this message. Because at the beginning, it was Lazarus begging, and now it's the rich man. I want you to listen, because it gets worse. It gets way worse. He answered then. So he's down there. He realizes, man, it's too late. And he says, then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family. For I got five brothers. Let them warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, you know what? They got Moses. They got the, prop, the prophets. Let them listen to them. They got the Bible. Let them listen to them. He says, no, Father Abraham, if someone uh, from the dead goes to them, they'll repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. So he's like, man, send this heavenly envoy down to my brothers so they won't have to suffer this irreversible irreversible error that I'm suffering from and you know it's bad when you don't even want your family members there with you. You know what I'm saying? That's when, he, that's when you know it's bad. He's like, bro, you had the ancient writings. You didn't believe. You had the Bible. And if they didn't believe Moses and the prophets that's, that where they saw miracles and they spoke the truth, they talked about taking care of the poor, right? If they didn't believe that, they're not going to believe the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus knew that because he knew many wouldn't believe even when he himself would rise from the dead. And many still don't. So physically, Hades is a terrible place. We know that. But the mental torment. Think about this, guys. Listen. This idea. I mean, his, his emotions were intact. His mind was fully functional. He, was, he had an intellectual conversation with Abraham. Think about this. Right? This idea where hell is just a place where you're screaming crazy, going out of your minds, insanely burst, like fire bursting out of you. That's probably more of a medieval teaching according to this passage here. Maybe that's what happens in the lake of fire. I don't know. But we know that the agony never stops. And the fire never goes out. And the rich man was also in agony. agony. His five brothers would probably end up in hell with him because he knew how they were living. And those times, I just, I just believe that this... Uh, Man, I believe that this mental suffering will be so bad in hell that that, that person will remember the occasion. They'll remember that sp specific occasion where someone shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and they rejected it. They'll, they'll remember the time in Bible study. They'll remember the time in church or in chapel where someone asked them about the condition of their heart or a friend asked them about the condition of their heart and they said, man, that's not for me. They'll, they'll remember those times without a doubt. And some people think that, man, hell is going to be this awesome place. Proverbs says this, man, when a wicked man dies, his expectation will perish. Isaiah says, man, there's no peace for the wicked. Basically, he's saying there's no fulfillment, no fulfillment in hell. And he dreams only bitter regrets. So all these jokes about people wanting to go to hell to be with their friends. So they had this one continual party. That's bull crap. There'll be a lot, there'll be a lot of people in hell. But they won't be a company to anybody. The Bible tells us that hell will be this loathsome, degrading place. It's what Isaiah says. Where everybody will be a stench and a disgust to everybody. People will think that you stink, you stink and no one will want to be around you. Probably because your flesh is on fire. Right? But here's the good news. So we talked about hell. Here's the good news. If you know the gospel story, God has done everything necessary to rescue you from eternal damnation. I've thrown this picture up several times. Every single thing. It's the anti-hell vaccine. No one wants vaccines, right? But this is one you want. And it's made with the blood of Jesus, right? 
But all I can think, man, honestly, is the regrets that some people will have um, if they choose not to believe or they choose not to follow, if they choose their own selfish ways and go their own path. Maybe someone in this room, to be honest. If you continue to deny Christ. Now, I will say that choosing God isn't easy. It's hard. It's hard to be a Christian, right? It's hard to believe in God. Christian or whatever you whatever, it's hard. Sometimes that means to dying to yourself, your your own selfish desires. Paul tells us to, to live as Christ is to die as gain. Why does he say that? Because some for some, the more that you have, the more that you feel like you don't need God. Isn't that the truth? That's why he says the root or the love of money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say money is evil. He says the root of it because many can't handle it, right? Let me ask you, here's a test. What if Satan, what if Satan came to you right now and he said, I will make you the greatest basketball player that ever lived. I'll give you, I'll give you all the fame. I'll give you, I'll give you money. I give you women, but here's the kicker. You've got to bow down and worship me. What would you do? What would you do? There's a lot of pressure on you guys from your families to be great. Would you take it? Satan tested Jesus the same way in the wilderness. We learned about that. He said, I will give you power to rule the whole world. You can have it right now instead of waiting on God to give it to you, he said. And God said, away from me, Satan. Like he, listen, Satan wants you to be prideful. He wants you to be selfish. He wants you to run from God. But this story here in Luke 16, it reminds us that without God, man, all of those things are temporary gratification. Short-term gratification. That's all that is. And we know that we're not here for a long time. And so the battle is going on for your soul right now. And I want you to listen to this quote. Um, and this is from a colleague of mine in, in seminary. She says that some of us literally are allowing demons to attach themselves to us, oppress us, or even possess us. When we choose to live sinful lifestyles, we give them access, then ultimately permission to stay. When we continually agree with their lies, you'll never be free from this. This is who you are because your parents are like this. You deserve this. God will never give you, uh, forgive you, so you might as well accept this. Man, you, you were born this way. You were born in this family. You were born in this environment, right? He knows your heart. He can't expect you to give that up. It's just too hard. You, you just do you, and you'll be okay. She says, don't believe the enemy lies. He has one agenda in mind when feeding you that garbage, and that's to separate you from your heavenly Father so that he can destroy you. She says, choose life. Choose to agree with the truth of God's word. And as we see in this passage, Luke 16, that man's sin's got a price tag. And remember what we learned in James, right? The one, who, the one who perseveres, who is steadfast, grows in completeness, Receive everything you have uh, or you need to get spiritually mature and then eventually receive the crown of life. But the one who man who just follows himself, his own selfish desires, I mean, you're lured into it. There's tons of acts of sin. And then you, you live in that sin without repentance, he says, equals death. And so I ask the question, man, who, who are you putting your faith in? Who are you putting your faith in? Is it Christ, the only one? The only one who provides eternal blessing, the only one who can save you, or are you caught up in the sin of the world, setting yourself up for a man an eternal regret? Which one is it? And you know you can experience the eternal blessing that Christ offers, right? We talked about this, for by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, right? We talked about that. In other words, you can, you can be rescued, guys. Look, Listen, you can be rescued. You just have to genuine, genuinely believe that Christ came to save you from your soul. That's it. That's it. But remember, the book of James tells us, and we just went through this with you guys. We went through this with the coaches, right? He gives us a word of caution. Read that bottom verse. Because it's not enough to say that you have faith. It's not some magical chant 
or a way of thinking that forces God and to let, to let you into heaven. In fact, if you say these words, they mean nothing in your heart. They're dead. Along with your salvation. Just like the rich man. Right? And just a reminder, deeds are, deeds are not something that you do to get something from God. It's, it's, not, a, it's not, oh, Dylan walked a, an old lady across the street today. God says, oh, checkbox. That's not what it is. You do these things because you love God. If you're a follower of God, these actions, these deeds, man, they should flow from you naturally. You, you get that? You do them because you love God. And now, listen, now that you have this full understanding of the reality of hell, Man, my hope that you would crawl on glass to get to the cross. To the only one that could save you and bring you home safely uh, to eternity. And I want you to think about this. I'm just going to close with this. Think about this. Think of you being in heaven, right? And you're up there. But you're able to catch glimpses just like Lazarus of those in Hades. You got a teammate down there. You got a loved one down there. You can't do nothing about it. Because there's this great chasm that you can't cross over. Think about that. What will be going through your mind? Man, I really wish I would have had that conversation. Man, I wish, I wish they would have listened to me. I tried to tell them. What happens if you're on the flip side, right? If you're in hell, looking up, seeing the joy, the eternal life that your teammates or your loved ones are having, and then that's my prayer for all of us, man, that we'll be in paradise with the rest of the Lord's faithful people. And that's what I'm urging you guys to do. I'm praying every day that you choose life. You choose to walk with God. We're starting a new year. It could be a new you. Where you choose life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Bow your heads with me. Look, maybe, maybe you're here this morning, guys, and you're struggling. Maybe you've been playing the game called being a follower of God, just going through the emotions, telling everyone what they want to hear, but when in secret, you're not living right. Maybe today's the day you need to make a 180. Maybe you're new to this whole Bible thing, man. You're unsure this morning about your eternal destination. And I'm begging you, I'm begging you man, don't leave here today without talking to me or someone else. If you're unsure, remember, it's not a magical chant. It's not a free ticket. It's a genuine belief in what Christ did accepting him, having a personal relationship with him. And man, if you want to make a statement of faith today, if you want to say, God, I, I want to follow you, just pray this prayer, man. I, God, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. Your word says that if I confess my sins and believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, I will be saved. And I want you to know, God, that I believe. I believe right now. So my prayer is that as a result of that statement of faith, that your actions show it. And from here forward, you go and impact the kingdom. God, I love these young men. Let them hear this word. And let it bring joy to their hearts, knowing that they do not have to experience eternal damnation. They can live forever with you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. And then we pray, amen. 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 Thank you, sir. Yeah, man. Right. Love you, brother. Let's go, buddy. Thanks for listening, man. Appreciate it.